I would like to begin with a story of the first time that I encountered Edgar Keret's writing. Um, and though it is a personal story, I believe it's also, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, it's a generational story. When I was in, uh, in my 11th grade, a friend from 12th grade asked me if I read a book called Pipes. Uh, I said that I didn't, and he lent me the book. I, uh, I took it home, it had a pink cover, it was relatively small, which was strange. It had a text on the cover, on the front cover, and not on the back cover, of what happens to you when you, lose, when you have no breath, not when you lose your breath, when you have no breath. And it felt strange. I read the first so story, and then I read the whole book. I never returned the book, of course. You never do <laughs> when, you learn, when you take uh, a book. And it didn't take me a long, a long time to understand why I liked Pipes. It was like the combination of the length of the stories, the plot, the language, the, char the characters, and it was the way Edgar Keret uh, took all these ingredients and put them together. Um, but what was more strange to me as an Israeli who used to, to read a lot of Israeli literature was it was the spirit of simplicity and the nonsense. Uh, for someone who was used to the long, thick books of Israeli writers with great protagonists and a lot of uh, multi-layered Hebrew, it was really strange. It felt as if Keret actually had fun while writing the stories. And that was strange. Um, and in a 70 years, years old, uh, my, I, I thought that as a 17 years old, I thought it was fun and that's it. But I think that when I look upon the writing today, I can see that it had a deep statement inside the stories. And I think that this statement is no less than revolutionary. And it's not only a revolution of the language, it's a revolution of what Keret tries to say, not only in Pipes, but also in other uh, books, in his comics books, which he wrote together with the illustrators uh, Rutu Modan and Asaf Hanukkah, uh, his children's books, his scripts, and even the sketches for the chamber quintet. Um, I believe it presents a new Israel, a new Israeli society, a new Israeli culture. Um, and it's, the revolution is not only in what Keret did, but in the amount of followers he has. A lot of Israeli writers tried, and some even succeed, to write as Keret does. A lot of Israeli script uh, writers have adapted his books into films. A lot of art artists uh, turned his books into artworks. And I believe it happened because all of them believed and saw that Keret's writing express what they want to say and does it accurately. And this puts his literary work in a new context, not only as literature for young teenagers, as I was, but as writing which expresses something new, exciting, and subversive. This is a cultural Israeli revolution with no guns or violence, but with words, no less. And we shouldn't be misled by the humorous tone. Though they are mostly fun, Carrot stories are also, are also at times sad, painful, and very, very seriously undermining everything that came before. And I want to finish with uh, a personal, not a personal, but a statement. There's nothing more dangerous to serious literature than the laughter, than the sense of the unseriousness which really hides a deep statement about human condition and about Israel's cultural and social condition at the same time. Keret's work signifies a revolt against the connection between high culture and seriousness. He proves that one can write great literature which is also popular and though it is often conceived as light it makes a statement. 
this is a new kind of Hebrew literature, more connected to people, and Keret's protagonists are usually defeated, but they still bear this special something inside to everyday life, to the materials which create the actual cultural fabric of Israeli society, but at the same time more detached and unrealistic from the so-called big national story. It seems that Keret has taken upon him the very serious task of being unserious, to challenge the borders of contemporary literature and culture again and again without becoming a caricature or a silent statue of himself. And I believe here lies the strength, the strength of his work. So I would like to welcome Edgar Keretz, who hailed as the voice of young Israeli and one of the most radical and extraordinary uh, writers. Um, his short stories collection are bestsellers in Israel and, and have been published in 22 languages. These, these include The Bus Driver Who Wanted to Be God, Gaza Blues, Missing Kissinger, and Girl on the Fridge. His most recent volume, Suddenly a Knock on the Door, became an instant number one bestseller in Israel. As a filmmaker, Carrot is the writer of sev several feature screenplays, including Skin Deep, which won first prize at several international film festivals, and was awarded the Israeli Oscar. Risk Cutters, featuring Tom Waits, was released in August 2007. Jellyfish, his first movie as a director, along with his wife, Shira Geffen, won the coveted Camera de O Prize for Best First Feature at the Cannes Fe Film Festival 2007. The animated feature film, $9.99, based on several of Carrot's stories, marries the tradition of Jewish humor with uncanny absurdity. Carrot is present, teaches at Ben Gurion University, and I want also to introduce you to Adrian Todd Zuninga, who is the host, the creator, and the creative chief officer of Literary Deathmatch, a competitive, humor-centric literary event now featured in 50 states worldwide that will make its TV debut in 2000, 2014. He is also president and founding editor of Opium Magazine, and his fiction has been featured in Gopher Illustrated and Steamy, and, and online at Lost Magazine and McSweeney's. He lives between Los Angeles and guest rooms all over Europe. He longs for a Chicago Cubs World Series and an, an EU passport. Guy who's going to be interviewing Edgar. Uh, before we started, I thought, for those of you who haven't read him, I was just going to read a story, then we're going to talk for a bit, he's going to read a story, then we're going to talk for a bit, and then we're going to ask you to talk for a bit, and then trigger him to talk for a bit more. So that's what we're up against. Um, uh, just to say a few brief words, Edgar, I met him, I went to see George Saunders read many years ago as part of uh, the Penn World Voices Festival in New York, and he was reading with this other guy, and I didn't care about that, and then I went, and George wasn't reading, and I was like, ugh, I had to hear this other guy's stories, but there were Edgar's stories, and I immediately fell in love. The line for George Saunders was very long, this, the line for Edgar Carrot was very short, uh, and I went up and I was like, that was amazing. Like, that's the stuff that I believe should be written in the world. It's the stuff I try to write. And uh, yeah, so he very quickly became one of my favorite writers. And uh, he, I don't know how I'm going to say this, but basically I've used Edgar's stories to give to girls I've had a crush on for a great many years. <laughs> and uh, so the reason I'm reading this story, uh, it's Edgar's second favorite story, I think, in this collection. Is that true? Pick a color. It's your second favorite. Yeah. Great memory, maybe. Uh, but I was one thing I do when I travel around the world to do literary death matches. I'll go to bookstores, and I'll see, you know, I'll buy a book. But I always check to see if Edgar's books are there and if George Saunders' books are there, because I'm just glad. So one time I was walking by an, uh, a, a shelf and I saw Edgar's book and I was excited, and there was this girl standing there and I just said, "Hey, you should get this one," and she yeah. said. She goes, oh, really? And then I just pulled it out, and without saying anything else, I read this story to her. <laughs> this is Pick a Color. A black man moved into a white neighborhood. He had a black house with a black porch where he used to sit every morning and drink his black coffee until one black night, his white neighbors came into his house and beat the crap out of him. He lay there curled up like an umbrella handle in a pool of black blood, and they kept on beating him until one of them started yelling that they should stop because if, they, because if he died on them, they might end up in prison. 
The black man didn't die on them. An ambulance came and took him far, far away to an enchanted hospital on the top of an inactive volcano. The hospital was white. Its gates were white. The walls of its rooms were white, and so was the bedding. The black man began to recover. Recover and fall in love. Fall in love with a white nurse and a white uniform who took care of him with great devotion and kindness. She loved him too. And like him, that, that love of theirs grew stronger with every passing day, grew stronger and learned to get out of bed and crawl. Like a small child, like a baby, like a black man who had been badly beaten. They got married in a yellow church. A yellow priest married them. His yellow parents had come to that country on a yellow ship. They had been beaten up by their white neighbors too. But he didn't get into all that with the black man. He barely knew him in any way. He didn't want to go there, with what, what with the ceremony and everything. He planned to say that God loves them and wishes them all the best. The yellow man didn't know that for sure. He tried lots of times to convince himself that he did, that he knows that God loves everyone and wishes us all only the best. But that day when he married the battered black man, not even 30 and already covered with scars and sitting in a wheelchair, it was, farter, it, it was harder for him to believe. God loves you both, he finally said anyway. God loves you and wishes you all the best, he said, and was ashamed. The black man and the white woman lived together happily until one day, when the woman was walking home from the grocery store, a brown man with a brown knife who was waiting for her in the stairwell told her to give him everything she had. When the black man came home, he found her dead. He didn't understand why the brown man had stabbed her, because he could have just taken her money and run. The funeral service took place in the yellow priest's yellow church. And when the black man saw the yellow priest, he grabbed him by his yellow robe and said, but you told us. You told us that God loves us. If he loves us, why did he do such a terrible thing to us? The yellow priest had a ready-made answer. An answer they taught him in a preschool. Something about God working in mysterious ways and that now that the woman was dead, she was surely closer to him. But instead of using that answer, the priest began cursing. He cursed God viciously, insulting and hurtful curses, the likes of which had never been heard in the world before. Curses so insulting and hurtful that even God was offended. God entered the yellow church on the, on the disabled ramp. He was in a wheelchair too. He had once lost a woman too. He was silvery, not the cheap glittery silver of, the banker's B, of a banker's BMW, but a muted matte silver. Once, as he was gliding among the many silvery stars with his silverly be silvery beloved, a gang of golden gods attacked them. When they were kids, God had once beaten one of them up, a short, skinny golden god who had now grown up and returned with his friends. The golden gods beat him with golden clubs of sunlight and didn't stop until they'd broken every bone in his divine body. It took him years to recuperate. His beloved never did. She remained a vegetable. She could see and hear everything, but she couldn't say a word. The silvery god decided to create a species in his own image so she could watch it to pass the time. That species really did resemble him, battered and victimized like him, and his silvery beloved stared wide-eyed at the members of that species for hours, stared and didn't even shed a tear. What do you think, the silvery god asked the yellow priest in frustration, that I created all of you like this because it's what I wanted? Because I'm some kind of pervert or sadist who enjoys all this suffering? I created you like this because this is what I know. It's the best I can do. The yellow priest fell to his knees and begged his forgiveness. If a stronger god had come to his church, he probably would have carried on cursing him, even if, even if he had to go to hell for it. But seeing the silvery, disabled God made him feel regret and sorrow, and he really did want his forgiveness. The black man didn't fall to his knees. With the, back, with, with the bottom half of his body paralyzed, he couldn't do things like that anymore. He just sat in his wheelchair and pictured a silvery goddess everywhere in the heavens looking down at him with gaping eyes. That imbued him with a sense of purpose, of hope even. He couldn't explain it to himself exactly why, but the thought that he was suffering just like a god made him feel blessed. Let's see, okay, that turned me on. Um, you know, reading that, I was reminded of when I heard you read Fatso, which is a story that you wrote about your wife. Yeah. Sweet, Fatso. And I remember listening to it, and I like, it's a very funny story, but I almost started crying. And I was like, that's, that's what is so amazing about your stories. Is that what you think is so amazing about your stories? <laughs> no, oh, well, you know, I, I, kinda, I only write them. I, I very rarely read them, you know, so well, I think that, can, can you hear me? Just take yeah. it to your mouth. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, well, 
uh, what I think uh, the the ways that I I use humor is I, I use humor as kind of like a defense mechanism. You know, it's kind of like a, an airbag in a, in your car. <laughs> like if everything's okay, then it doesn't kind of inflate. But only if you hit something or if you're in danger, then it kind of works. So uh, so I f I think that I only use humor when I'm in a place that is very volatile and painful and dangerous, you know, this is the only time when, when humor enters the picture. If everything is great, you know, you don't need to be funny. Right, yeah. Well, with that story in particular, there's, there is like a subtle humor, and it's, it's sort of what I learned from George Saunders, which is, like all humor is in Laugh Out Loud, some of it just unlocks or, or sort of moves something inside you that's not exactly funny, but it like breaks something open in you. Um, when you're writing and you're dealing with these things, like, are you sort of giggling as you type, and then it, it suddenly takes a turn, and you're like, "Oh, that's not funny anymore." Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, the truth is, that, the truth is that kind of uh, usually the feeling is is different. I feel very embarrassed, and then when I'm kind of able to kind of, it, it's like like I feel I'm naked, you know, mm -hmm. and then I kind of I take a joke and put it here, you know, so I say, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of like there is. I, I think I think that. Again, like first there is the discomfort, discomfort, and then the humor comes in. Right. How how many books are or how many stories are in this book in your new collection? Uh, I think about thirty or thirty-two. I don't know. How many of those would you think are funny versus like you just ran down? We don't have to talk about humor the whole time. Yeah. But like, how many stories would you? I don't know. I mean, do you think you're a hum Do you think you're funny or humorous in your stories? No, it's it's funny because when people uh, come to me and say, whoa, you know, you're, you're so funny and like, you know, I, I, I laughed when I read your book and I, you know, it's so, it's fun and it's entertaining. Then I kind of, I, with the years I've learned to hide it, but I really get offended. Like, you know, because, yeah. because, because it's really like, you know, you, it's kind of like this kind of feeling that, you know, when you sleep on a banana peel and people are laughing, <laughs> then you say, you know, call an ambulance. You right. know, why are you laughing? You know. So, and I think that many times when you write uh, uh, the effect that it, what you're writing has on people, it's not the effect that you. I, it's not even I don't intend anything, but it's not what you're experiencing yourself. And and I think that m it, it's something that I have in life, not only in writing. That many times, you know, uh, when I'm angry, if people find it amusing, you right. know, it's like, you know, I have these kind of things that I, I, I don't know, somebody kind of wired the, with the projection ability to my emotion kind of a, right. not the best way. Do you, I mean, so, I mean, just for those people who haven't read, that story is a pretty common length for you, you know, two to sort of four pages, sometimes it expands to six or seven pages. But um, I, I guess what I really want to know is why do people love your work? I mean, why do you think people, because yeah. It's great. I mean, and by uh, the way, I, I talked to an actress in, um, in London that I was trying to get to do our show, and I told her how great she was, and I said, I just want you to understand that I have good taste, so my opinion of you is more important than all the other people love you. So what I'm saying is, if I'm saying you're great. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> no, I know, I know. But, but uh, the, the truth is, again, you know, there's something a very surprising, I think, about success in general. I think that success is something that surprises me, you know? I right. think failure seems so natural, you know? It's yeah. A, uh, but when I, when I started writing, it was during my compulsory army service, and uh, whenever I would write a story, I would print three copies, you know? That was the print run, like <laughs> one for my brother, another two for two of my best friends, right. and the few of them would read it, and they say, one would say, oh, I liked it, the other would say it was boring, you know, the third one would say, oh, it's good, but not as good as the others, you know? Right. And that would, was it. And I, I, I seriously, like, I felt blessed, you know, by the fact that if, when I print those pages, I know that those three people, people are gonna read it, read them, you know? Right. And the idea, like, the, the, the energy that was in the room was that I was writing for them, uh, because they were, uh, uh, because they were important for me, but also because other people won't get it, you know. So, so I think the, so. I, I think, like the f everyone who's not those three people who ever read my story and said, 
I know what you're talking about. It was like a big surprise for me because I, I also think that, that uh, it, when I started writing during my, my compulsory army service, I had a feeling that I was different from other people, that uh, I was a horrible soldier. I kept getting into trouble. And, uh, and, I, and like basically when you were soldiers, then the first thing they want you is to kind of conf conform and you know, and like you have to look like everybody else. You know, you have to walk like everybody else. You have to do all those things. You know, I can't walk like everybody else. I walk like this way. You know, <laughs> so so the idea, like you know, the, I I kept fe feeling that you know, I, that I'm saying the wrong things and I'm feeling the wrong feelings. You know, and when I and I think when I started writing my stories, I actually didn't want many people to read them because I thought that they lynch me or something, you know? Right. And, and the humanizing thing about it was that when people read the story and we said, they said, we get it, you know? I realized that, you know, that they were just as fucked up as I was, <laughs> but they were much better at hiding it than, right. than me, you know? So there was something about, about kind of writings that kind of made me understand that it's not that there are normal people and I'm not normal, that there are no normal people. There are people who can pass as normal, you know, <laughs> and people who are less good at doing that. Right, yeah. I, this is one thing I've never talked to you about, but um, I mean, you, it's kind of crazy that you're like, you're like the Israeli writer, but your work is now, it's everywhere, right? I mean, do you know how many languages it's, it's in? Uh, <laughs> it came out in, my books were published in 32 languages. Wow. Like you have a tattoo that's just like, you just get another. <laughs> Yeah, it's like McDonald's. It's like <laughs> yeah, yeah no. 32 languages served. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what's so cool to me. I mean, for me, it's very cool to say, oh, I know this Israeli writer who's wonderful. You should read this. I mean, but do you, you know, I mean, it makes me sound more worldly. But did you, <laughs> could you even, I mean, we've already talked about this a little bit, but could you even conceive of the fact that, like, people in Los Angeles and people in London and people in other languages that you were translated into, like, that those people were sitting around in their beds like, oh, cool. Like, that's crazy. Right? It's amazing. I, I must say, you know, just kind of, because I, because I really think that there is something in this event that instantly, they kind of like you see on, in stage, on stage and there are all those people here. And like, even without speaking about it, there's always this feeling like, why are we on stage? And they're, they're like, you know, we should trade. They should have, they also right. have great stories to tell. Yeah. And from this kind of stress, then there is this kind of need kind of to glorify ourselves, to justify the right. fact that we're on stage and they're not. But, but I must say that I've, I'm kind of published in many languages, but I think in every language I'm published, very few people read me. So oh, just, that's good. Just <laughs> yeah. <that>. So <laughs> right. Uh, but, uh, but, but it is amazing. You know, it, it's funny because I once, uh, I did a reading event, I think it was in Norway, and I have a story called The Bus Driver Who Wanted to Be God. And after uh, uh, the, 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 the event, there was a book signing, and they came, those two sisters, they were about like 60 years old, and they said, we wanted to ask you something, and I said to them, yes, and they said, the bus driver wanted to be got a story. Is it about the, the f number 14 bus <laughs> driver, you know, in Oslo? <laughs> the one with the mustache, because we know him. <laughs> and, and, and there is something really strange that in a sense like the more specific you become uh, in you become mo more universal because let's say if if you write about i don't know a city then it will feel like a city but if you write what's inside a guy's mind then if you go you zoom in to this kind of close up you know extreme yeah. close up then suddenly it's what everybody can think you know so so for me like First, it was a surprise that people who are not my brother and best friend <laughs> get what I'm thinking. But, but after that, you see that if you, you that there's something universal about like human emotion, human vulnerability, and and you know, and we and we all we're all gonna die, and we're all afraid of dying. You know, wherever we are, so we can speak different languages and have different weather, but we're pretty much the same. Do sadly. You do you think that uh, part of why you write is to, to have something that exists once you're gone? Or is there some panic in you that, allow, that you're writing because you're like, oh, I've only got so much time before some bus drives No, it's, re it's really like, you know, I, I was once in an event uh, with, a, with a very famous writer, and he said, I don't care what people say about me now. I, I care what, what about people who say about me 
100 years from now, that's what's important. Ask to him, I really don't care. Like, after I die, you know, like, burn all my books and say that they were crap. You know, I'm just, <laughs> I, I just, I, I must say that there is something about writing that, you know, that, I, in a sense, writing for me is always plan B. You know, when there's something that I want to do in life and I succeed doing it, I just do it. When I fail, I write a story about it, you know. So, <laughs> so, so I'm saying, like, if you ask me if I would rather be a better writer or a better person, you know, for sure I would like to be a better person, you know. But being unable to be a better person, <laughs> then maybe, Might you know, right. the plan B would be like, and you know, it's, a, it's, like, it's like my story, the bus driver wanted to be God. It's a story about a guy who wanted to be God, but couldn't become God, so he went for his second option, which was to be a bus driver, you know. So, <laughs> so I'm saying, saying, like, I'm kind of, I'm the guy, who, who, the writer who wanted to be a guy with enough coordination to get through life, you know. <laughs> and it didn't work, so I went for the plan B. Right. Um, I, I'm interested in how you, like obviously being from Israel, Israel, like you're a Jewish writer, and do you, is there any resentment in that when people sort of say, like, you're like, well, I'm just a writer, I'm just a guy, or is, it, is that something that you, sort of like, that's a shield that you go out with, and you're like, yes, I'm an Israeli writer first. Uh, well, uh, the truth is, that, you know, if I had to pick an identity, you know, if, like, if you could choose, I see myself much more as a Jewish writer than an Israeli writer, mm. just for the fact that, you know, I think nationality is like kind of like, it's a bunch of people, like, it's like, you know, a, a tenant meeting, basically, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, for me, like, being Jewish, it's kind of, it's, it's a heritage, you know, it's like, uh, my parents are Holocaust survivors, uh, and, uh, and they, I'm saying, like, you know, there's something that kind of kept this kind of, this identity of being, being first religious and then being sec secular through the years. And I think that this is something that kind of formed my identity much more than the fact that I have a passport that, that I can't get into half of the countries in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but, uh, but, but I must say that, you know, there is something about being Israeli that, uh, that it's kind of, it's kind of it, you, you, you automatically get all those people who like you and hate you and actually, you know, and usually the ones that hate you are good-looking girls from Berkeley, and <laughs> and, the, and the ones that like you are kind of overweight policemen in the Midwest, you know, <laughs> and you kind of you kind of wish that it was the other way around, but 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 I'm saying it's really it's really funny because many times I go to places and people say to me I'm a I'm a pro pro Palestinian I'm anti-Israeli or anti-Israeli or vice versa and. I never met anybody who was like pro blonde and <laughs> anti redhead. You know, it's like it's like there is something like in this kind of a empty generalization. You know, it's like I'm, I, you know, I'm not pro Israel in the sense that there are many Israelis that I hate. You know, so, but this idea that like I don't know pe people who are pro Italian. You know, I don't know people <laughs> who are, you know, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so there is something in this kind of reduction. That I've been in events, you know, where I was called baby killer and people spat on me. You know, and the. And like, and it's different when they spit on you because they're Israeli, and or when they spit on you because you didn't talk nicely to the girlfriend or something. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's something kind of less yeah. personal in that. <laughs> but, but I've been for like, you know, I've been. It's it's a. It's kind of a strange. It's kind of a strange experience. It's a. It's I don't know. Like I, sometimes when you drive your car and somebody kind of says how you drive and thing, and then he starts cursing you. You say you're an asshole, you know, and, and you feel that, and you feel like. You, First you're friend, and then you say, this guy doesn't know me, you know? And uh, w he must have had a very bad day, you know? <laughs> so sometimes you really have this feeling that you're kind of being attacked or loved for something that has nothing to do with you. Right. I mean, but you, li you live in Tel Aviv, and so you're sort of in the center of that, that world. How, <coughs> how does living there affect how you write? Like, what do you get out of that versus if you lived in Paris or New York or... Uh, well, well, you know, I often say that, uh, that it's debatable if Israel is a good place to live in, but it's certainly a good place to write in because, you know, writing is all about conflict and friction and tension, you know, and uh, so, so it's really, it's a place that is extremely interesting because you have people coming from different backgrounds and, and kind of, almost everybody kind of has a very, very strong agenda and he's willing kind of to, to give everything kind of to serve that agenda, you know. I, I'm saying you're just talking about my family, okay? So my parents are both Holocaust survivors, and I'm, I have 
two siblings, you know, my older, the eldest is my brother and my sister. And so my, the eldest, my brother, he's, a, a, he's an a, a anarchist left-wing anti-Zionist who had started the legalized marijuana movement that almost got into parliament and would left Israel with his wife 10 years ago to move to Thailand the first six years he spent living with her on a tree with high-speed internet, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and my sister uh, uh, it was an artillery instructor who after the Lib first Lebanon war uh, had become ultra-orthodox and she has uh, 11 children and 10 grandchildren, you know? And, and, uh, and I'm saying like we all come from the same family, we all communicate, we all love each other, but it's like kind of everybody kind of is looking for something and he's trying to transcend and he's trying to get what life is about and trying to make, make them better according to his own agenda. And I feel that this is something that has a lot to do with kind of Israeli intensity. You know, is there is something about this, this kind of, I don't know, existential situation <laughs> that, uh, that you feel many times that people kind of go for what they think counts, you know, and uh, they don't have this kind of a maybe nonchalance uh, thing that, we, that I'm always kind of jealous of. You know, we, we had a, a number one hit song, which it's a lousy hit song, but it was very successful, which was called uh, uh, To Live in New Zealand. <laughs> and the singer said that uh, I want to live in New Zealand uh, to hear a cannon go off only on the Queen's birthday. That's the that's the, ch the chorus, and there's something about this like that you know that I guess uh, it sometimes it could be overwhelming, but but all the time it kind of you have this kind of urge to say something and to say what's in, what's on your mind. You, you bringing up your brother and his girlfriend, uh, it reminded me of your wife, his wife. Sorry, yeah. uh, his second wife. Did I ever tell you about how how my wa my brother married his first wife? No. Okay, so, <laughs> so my, my brother met his first wife on a hill. She was a, a how, do you, how do you call it? Like Shepherd? Yeah. A go I was kidding, but yeah. I thought it would be fun to guess. <laughs> you were I she thought was that a, 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 a goat shepherd. Goat shepherd. Whoa, man. <laughs> you sure didn't tell you? You start okay. the sentence, I'll finish it. That's okay. uh, how I play it. Yeah, my English is, isn't that good. So, so uh, he met her, and they decided that, that if they want to get married, they get married uh, by their own religion. So they kind of invented a religion. <laughs> and the idea was that they, they got married in a kind of a performance art thing, you know? And they, they sold tickets to the wedding. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and the idea was that, uh, let's say, for example, he faxed to her this fax saying, will you marry me? And she faxed him back on stage from the other side saying, I, I will. Oh and then uh, both of them kind of did some things that kind of represented what they think uh, uh, being married is like. And my brother made this beautiful song that it, uh, it's a, it's a called, co co he called it a dancing a tango in a spacesuit. And it's about like two people dancing tango in space that they know that if they miss one step, they're going to go to the. And, uh, and his gold shepherd first wife. Uh, she uh, she did this kind of performance thing, in which she breastfed a porcupine, <laughs> and then there was and then there was and then there was the second part that had to do something with a a constrictor a snake, right? Which she borrowed from the zoological garden in Israel, but it apparently before his part came, he escaped. And it was never found, and they, <laughs> and they had they were on trial or something from because they couldn't bring it back, and they, and and she was not not very sane, you know, and and it, and it was no no and and the thing was that it, this was also a very traumatic uh, experience for my Polish mother when you know people came to her, <laughs> kissing her and saying oh we're so excited and and uh, and she said are you from from the gold shepherd? Side of the family, and said, "Oh no, no, we paid the hundred check at the, <laughs> the door." So, uh, so uh, but but what happened was that when my brother finally kind of internalized the fact that, you know, that she's difficult, and they decided to have a divorce. So she said that she only divorced him in a performance art thing. <laughs> and he said to her, "You know, but but 
I did it because I loved you. Now I don't love you. You know, I just <laughs> want to be away from you. And it was, and they had like kind of a very long legal kind of fight about uh, if they divorce and perform, if they sell right. tickets for the divorce or just kind of say goodbye. You know what's funny is that you kept saying my brother, my brother, but you know when you're like talking about yourself but you're trying to put it off somebody? So this is a story about you and your wife, isn't it? <laughs> you're just saying, no, no, my ah, brother. Oh, I know a guy. I know yeah, a yeah guy. I know a guy. Who this, no, yeah. but actually, this brings me to the thing I really want to ask you about, which is how you met your wife. Because I'll say this. When I hung out with you once, you told me and some friends I was with uh, how you met your wife. And I went out that night. I was just like, that is such an amazing story. And the girl's like, you realize <laughs> it's Edgar Carrot. He wasn't being... That wasn't a true story. I was like, so I want you to tell me how you met your wife, and then I will tell if it's different. Yeah. No, no, no. It's uh, I, but I, I believed I, you. No, so. I must say, I must say that uh, that uh, I, I, I'm, I do lie quite a lot, but <laughs> no, really. But uh, I, I'm I, like, I, first of all, I'm, I'm much more honest overseas because I don't know you people. So right. <laughs> yeah. tomorrow I'm in Austin, Texas. Who cares? You know, but. Uh, but, uh, but I do lie qu quite a lot, but I never lie when I tell stories, really. Oh, yeah. It's because, I f really, and, and it's kind of a religious thing, I think, because for me, stories kind of is a place of sincerity, mm -hmm. you know? So, so in essence, you know, like to say this and this, ha it happened when it didn't happen, I don't need to do that because I can right. write fiction. So when I tell stories, they're always true. So the story about how I met my wife, like, I mean, I, I've met my wife before, but how we became together, was that I was in this party in a club and she just entered the club and, and I was about to leave. And, uh, uh, and she said, uh, she, didn't uh, she didn't realize that I was going out, so she said, uh, uh, did you just get here? So I said, no, actually, I was leaving. And she looked at me and she said, kiss me. <laughs> and like, you know, there was this loud music and I kind of looked at her and there were many people around us and like my wife, uh, She's uh, very beautiful and very smart, but seemed always to me like kind of a, like I never knew her well before that, but she seemed like a very shy person. And, and like I've, I really wanted to kiss her, but it didn't seem right, even though she said, so I said to her, how about we just go and grab a coffee, okay? And <laughs> maybe like, you know, things are moving too fast. And like she said, okay. And we sat and we had a coffee and, and after we talked a lot. And after that, I walked her home, you know, and then like we became, a couple, and when we became a couple, I said to her, you know, it's, it's really pretty amazing because, like, you know, I thought I knew you, and then suddenly I meet you, and like I said, you know, I'm going to leave, and you say, kiss me, and she said, I didn't say kiss me. I said, you never get a cab. <laughs> 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 so yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? So I'm glad to confirm that that's true because I believe. I, it had to be true. Um, but you went on, like you do more than writing fiction, you deal with films, and you had written the script for Jellyfish, which ended up winning the camera door at... Uh, at no, at I didn't write the script. My wife you, your wife the wrote the script. I, I co-directed it. You co-directed it, that's yeah. what it was. And like, how did that happen? Because that was sort of a, like nobody wanted to make it. Yeah, yeah. It's a, the, the thing is that when my, my wife wrote the screenplay, I read it and I was really, really moved by it. And I said to her, you know, you, you're a lucky woman because you're husband knows all the filmmakers in Israel and they're all kind of my friends and they all owe me stuff, you know? <laughs> so what, I'm, what we're going to do is sit together and make a list, you know, we, we kind of do kind of a, like the equivalent of literary death match in our mind. Right. And then we pick the two best ones to make this script and then we let them both read and they both come and they beg, you know, to make the movie and the ones that we beg more nicely, we give the screenplay to him. Right. And basically, both of them are my friends, so they read the screenplay and they both came and they, when they came, like there was something very awkward when they came and, and basically they were both very kind of honest people and they said, listen, this isn't a screenplay, you know, this is a 82 page poem <laughs> which has no narrative. It, it's very difficult to interpret it visually and the, if we did find a way to shoot it, it would come out the b boring worst film in the world. And you can't see that because it's your wife. <laughs> so, like, I, so I was very, very, very offended. 
And I went to my wife and I said to him, fuck them, we don't need them. They don't want to think of a bunch of, like, yeah, yeah. You know, and I was very, like, th this, like, very tense. And I said, I said, well, we, we'll make the movie ourselves, you know. And uh, my wife said to me, but we don't know how to direct movies. <laughs> Small detail. And I said to her, well, you know, you know, th that's, w that's what the problem in our relationship. That's what I really dislike about you, you know. Because I think that, you know, for me, a perfect relationship is that if your husband says to you, we, we're going to do something great, then you say to him, sure, I believe in you. We're going to do something great. <laughs> you don't say to him, you don't know what you're talking about, you know. Right. That's, that's, we always get back to this point, you know. So, so she said, okay, I'm sorry, you know. If you say, I believe it, you know, we, we'll do something great. And then she left. And then I said, oh, fuck, like, you know, because I'm very good at fighting with people and and kind of projecting the fact that I'm very badly offended. But why the moment she left, I realized that we don't know how to direct film. Right. You know? <laughs> but it was kind of this kind of thing, like, you know, it's your wife and you have to kind of protect your self-esteem. So I said, okay, now we have to go with it. Like, you know, because right, if, yeah. you, if you step back and say, no, you're really right, you know, it's like we're going to live together the rest of our lives. So, so we made a movie. It's amazing. I mean, because it won the camera door. So it won the first director's prize at Cannes. Yeah. I want to read uh, two critiques of the film, or not, one, one boast. Uh, oh shoot, it's not on here. Wait, hold on, maybe it is on here, because these are hilarious to me. Oh, so it was called a beautifully, let me just check the time, because that clock keeps saying it's the exact, oh, it is working, okay. Mm. This is just going so slow and awful. <laughs> so the reviews, there was one that said it was a beautifully strange movie, and one said, marvelously inventive in a dreamy, arty, alluring, cockeyed tale involving three unrelated women in Tel Aviv. But, this, I've always wanted to ask you about this review, and I thought we should do it in front of friends. From The Onion? Uh, no, this, is, uh, oh, this okay. was just a negative review. Yeah. It says, although it runs 78 minutes, it feels like 78 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I remember after I'd seen it, I went on to read the reviews, because I was like, oh, that was so cool. Like, this work. And then I read that review, and I just thought, that is just hilarious. I don't... Well, like, I, because there is a funnier one that I thought. Oh yeah. there, there was a review in The Onion, and, and the guy says, that there is a scene... Uh, in the movie where the protagonist said that uh, when she was a, a, a child, uh, she went to the beach and her uh, mother had promised that she would buy her ice cream when the ice cream guy comes. And, but she, f she had a fight with her father, so she never bought her that ice cream. So in the onion, they said, like, my God, like, if, if, some, if I could just go back in time and buy her this ice cream, we wouldn't have to sit and see this movie, you know? <laughs> What is this? Like we see a movie about the girls that didn't get an ice cream cone? Come on, like, right. you know. That's hilarious. Well, the other yeah. film that like was the, I guess it's probably the biggest one in terms of distribution was Risk Cutters. Yeah. Uh, was that like, that's kind of the biggest? Uh, I, in the U.S. Yeah. Like I'm saying, I had, like, you know, outside of the U.S. and I think Jellyfish was seen was by it? more people, but yeah. in the U.S., yeah. And, and that's a film about uh, people who kill themselves. They go to sort of a, a s not hell, they go to a bit of a purgatory with all the people yeah, who kill so themselves. Yeah, uh, so I think it's, it's kind of like it's a political PR thing because what they, they say it's just a place where all the people who kill themselves go to, you know, so no judgment. But, but who wants to live in a world where all the people that you meet are people who kind of gave up on life, you know? So, so it is hell, but you know, but if you sue them, they say, hey, we just put you in this neighborhood with people like you, you know? But right. So... Uh, but I, you know, it's it's based on a novella that I wrote. But right. but it was the screenplay, and it w was written and directed by by a, 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 a Croatian filmmaker who moved to the U.S. called uh, Goran Dukic, and he lives in L.A. Yeah. And and there is actually a funny thing about it because when it, when he contacted me wanting to make this movie, I already had an offer from a, from a, a quite well known. A, French Jewish director who uh, who uh, lived in Israel, knew Israel, but like moved to France. And when he called me, he said, "You know, I want to make a, a a movie out of it." And I said to him, "Listen, you know, I don't want to offend you because you, you sound like a very uh, intelligent, and I saw sh the shots that you made, and it's really beautiful. But but look, this movie is really very very much about Israeli sensibility, you know." It's really like you don't know Israel. You've never been to Israel. You don't know wha how we like, you know. So how can you make a movie about it? And he was uh, very, very quiet. And after this kind of long pause, he said, Mr. Carrot, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Yugoslavia 
is a pretty fucked up place too. <laughs> And, and you know, and I think that there is something about uh, adaptation that really, is that, you know, like, I don't know, when you see Apocalypse Now, you know, it's somebody who, who read Heart of Darkness, which take place in Africa and tells the story of missionaries. Uh, uh, and they said, wow, this is just like Vietnam, yeah. you know? And I think that that's the idea of the adaptation. Just and and, and, uh, and the, I think that what happened with Goran, who was in Yugoslavia, you know, during uh, during the uh, the fight, you know, between the Ser Serbian and the Croats, you know, he had memories. He told me stories, you know, that like I can't kind of live in Israel, but but Israel sounds softcore, you know, to yeah, yeah. like you know, the, uh, the, he he told me, for example, that you know that they had these things that uh, uh, they call it sniper parties, and the idea was that many t in the in the time of the war, there were actually like people who were pro Serbian who lived in Croatian cities. So what those people would do, they, they had like sniper rifles, and they were neighbors, and they would go and shop. And at night, they would just go, shoot somebody, and go back in and watch the TV. And like, nobody knew who they were. Yeah, yeah. So students who wanted to be invo involved in the thing and just also to have fun, they would uh, put people on roofs. And they had, because those people had infrared uh, things, they had Googles who could spot infrared. And what would happen was that all those people would kind of be on roofs, and if they spot somebody, they would call their friend and say, okay, we give you an address. And basically, a bunch of students would come, let's say like 60, 70 students with uh, crates of beer, break the door open, throw the guy out of the window, and have a party in his house. You know, so, so there is something, so, so there is something uh, uh, about this kind of thing that when I, I, when I wrote Nagas Happy Campus, it was about basically about people, who, I didn't write it about people who killed themselves. I wrote about the people who kind of gave up on life. They were kind of short-circuited <coughs> in life, you know? Right. And that I, I've had this experience and, and knew many people like this on kind of, uh, on my compulsory army service because you see people that are, by the age of 19, they've been around, they've done that. You know, they saw their best friend's brain kind of blown to pieces. They, sh they shot somebody by mistake, and they, they did all those kind of things. And, and it was like kind of too much emotion was going through them. And I said, you know what? That's not a good thing. You know, I'd rather be apathic. And it was a, this st a story about those people and about myself, about how somebody who kind of gave up on life is being kind of sucked back to life. He's been kind of what m would make him want to feel again? What would make him feel that he can kind of tolerate that? And Goran knew wha what it was all about, you know, because it wasn't about being Israel, it was being about being a traumatized human being. The, that's one of my favorite stories of yours. And the, the film's ending is a little bit different, a little neater and Hollywoodish, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you dislike that? Because I think, no, or no. was like the end of your story not capable of so, so I tell you something about Goa because Goan is like a, he's he's like he's he's a man who who's very good at literary adaptation because first of all he loves literature and he respects literature a lot and when he did the movie he said to me that he wants to shoot two endings uh, one of them was a, an ending that he had in his mind which was a happy ending, and the other was the ending that was in the story, which was a much sadder one. And I said to him, why do you want to shoot two of them? And he said, because, you know, there's something about the first ending that it feels kind of more natural for me, mm -hmm. but the second one, you know, it just, I don't want to change your story. And I said to him, you know what, go on, shoot only the happy one, the one that you want to shoot. And I tell you something, like, as somebody who kind of, who has a little bit more experience in, in life, you know, a day after you shoot it or a day after you premiere it, you go back to your bookshelf, take the book, and you see that you didn't change the story. The story changed, stayed the same, you know. You were just making your movie. And, and I really felt that there was something actually about the, the ending that is different from the book, that is, it's very true and very natural to the adaptation because, because it, it, when Goran made his film, you know, it went somewhere, and it went to this very kind of positive place. And when I wrote the story, it went somewhere and went to a place that it was sad, m much sadder. But, but uh, I, when I see the movie, it, it seems complete. And of course, it's not how I imagined it, but 
if it would have been how I imagined it, there would be no point in making it. You know, it would be like like faxing the book to another medium. You know, right. who needs that? You know, yeah, yeah. I think that an adaptation is always kind of it's always kind of a very specific and different reading of a text, like a, a good adaptation. One thing while talking to you is like all these synapses are connecting in my head, like firing off, like use that as a, a trampoline for a story and. And uh, actually, your wife's story, the, the story of you meeting your wife, I did steal a little element of that for my own fiction. And I was just thinking, like, there's all this stuff that, that I could use, I could steal from what you're saying, but I wonder... You don't have to steal, I give it to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, you just give it away. But for, so I, I was just thinking about inspiration for your stories. And, like, you write fiction, you don't write nonfiction as far as I know. I mean, I guess you might write... No, actually, actually my, my latest book is kind of like, it's called The, the Seven Good Years or The Seven Fat Years. And it's like it's a bunch of kind of pieces that I wrote uh, since the birth of my son. Oh, cool! And until his seventh birthday. And again, it's like it's full of true s stories. Uh, for example, like when uh, my son was born, we went to a, a the how do you call this ward? The maternity ward or the maternity ward? Yeah. Uh, and the uh, and my wife was there, and and uh, it was a hospital in Atania. Mm -hmm. And just when we got there, there was a suicide bombing. So they started bringing all the wounded people. So all the doctors went to take care of them because they r ran to ER. And my, my wife was in labor, but there was no doctor there. So I, would I ran kind of trying to get a doctor. And I was stopped by all kinds of TV crews. And they started uh, shouting, uh, celebrity in a, in a terrorist bombing, celebrity in a terrorist bombing. <laughs> and they started kind of running to me. And they said, no, no, no. just." My wife, uh, and so I said, okay, so celebrity co commenting on it. So I said, no, 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 you know, it's my, and you know, and I kind of put them away and I was able to get a doctor. And when I got the doctor back, my, my, my wife's labor stopped. It's like the baby said, you know what? I don't think it's a good idea going out. <laughs> I see what's going out. We'll maybe, maybe I'll stay in another couple of months, you know. Right. And let me think it over. So, so, so th this, was, this is how the book begins. Oh, that's cool. Because, I mean, I, I, don't want, I want you to read that story, but we don't have time because I want to get into one other thing before we do. But the story that you were going to read was based on me. Yeah, yeah. It's and actually it's called Todd. T can you read the first, like, two paragraphs just to give context? Because I want to ask you some questions about uh, it. Okay. It's, got, it's, a, it's called Todd, and it goes like this. Uh, My friend Todd wants me to write him a story that will help him get girls into bed. <laughs> You've already written stories that make girl cry, he says and ones that makes them laugh. So now write ones that will make them jump into bed with me. I try to explain to him that it doesn't work that way. True, there are some girls who cry when they read my stories, and there are some guys who forget guys, Tad interrupts. Guys don't do it for me. I'm telling you this up front, so you won't write stories that will get anyone who reads it into my bed. Just girls. I'm telling you this up front to avoid unpleasant unpleasantness. So I explain to him again in my patient tone, that it doesn't work that way. A story isn't a magic spell or hypnotherapy. A story is just a way to share something you feel with other people, something intimate, sometimes even embarrassing. That, that Great, that interrupts again. So let's share something embarrassing with your readers that will make girls jam jump into bed <laughs> with me. He doesn't listen that, Tad. He never listens, at least not to me. I met Tad at a reading he organized in Denver. When, we, when he talked about stories, he loved that evening. He became so excited that he began to stammer. He has a lot of passion, that dad, a lot of energy, and it's obvious that he doesn't really know where to channel it all. We didn't get to talk a lot, but I saw right away that he was a smart person and a match, someone you could depend on. That is the kind of person you want beside you in a burning house or in, on a sinking ship, the kind of guy you know won't jump into a lifeboat and leave you behind. But at the moment, we're not in a burning house or in a sinking ship. We're just drinking organic soy milk, milk, la, la, soy milk latte in a funky natural cafe in Williamsburg. And that makes me a little sad because if there was something burning or sinking in the area, I could remind myself why I like him. But when Tad <laughs> starts hammering away at me to write him a story, he's hard to stomach. That's great. Yeah. That, uh, but, but I, I, ju I just, I just want to say something, like, you know, Todd mentioned, you know, that, uh, that uh, I once read a story I wrote about my wife called Fatso, 
that there is something about when I write a story about someone, it's not that, uh, unlike the stories that I tell about things that had happened, it's not that I write something about something that had happened. It, 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 I write something about some kind of moving thing, something that had moved me meeting a human being. So I basically, I write stories only about people that I like a lot, and usually they come up out bad in those stories, but it doesn't change the fact that I like them a lot. Yeah, uh, d just to give you, uh, if you go to Electric Literature, that story is on that website. And uh, I, I just was remembering how that came about, so I looked through my emails. And we, he had emailed me about being in The New Yorker, and was, I was very excited for him. And then I had just moved to LA, and I was from Paris, where I couldn't speak the language well enough. And then back here, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. America again, I'll flirt with people who want to kiss me. But it was, it's a very difficult town for that. I found. And then, so I wrote him, I said, all of these women are beautiful. I just can't figure a way to sleep with, uh, a way to sleep with them. Write a story that'll help me figure that out. And he wrote, I'll, I'll try and write that girls, gr that get girls to sleep with Todd story. Seriously, give me a week. And then, uh, and then you did. So I appreciate it, but I'm still, I uh, never kissed a girl since you wrote that story. So I don't know what's no, going on. No, but, but you know, the interesting thing is that w now when you read it, I realize it's very much like, like, my wife's story, because you never asked me to write you a story that would get girl into bed. Like, it w I, re I replied in the email to something that you didn't say. Re which uh, is? Uh, re no, read, read the email, what you, what you said or what, no, I what you said. I said, uh, and all of these women are beautiful, I just can't figure a way to sleep with them. Write a story that'll help me figure that out. Yeah, so, so you said, write me a story that will help me understand how I can sleep with them. And I said to you, Ah, okay, you want me to write a story that will make them go to bed? You right. never asked me for that. <laughs> right, that's true. Yeah. I should have yeah, been more, okay. when you're requesting a story from one of your favorite writers, be very specific <laughs> to its intended no, effect. No, you better choose a, a writer that listens, you know. I, it yeah. helps. We're going to take questions from the audience in just a sec, but I did want to talk about something, because when you were in L.A. Uh, for, the, for the festival, um, your father just passed away, and, yeah. then, and my mother had passed away almost a year before that, and like, I was like, it's weird, but like something finally unlocked in me when I had gone through about 11 months that I was like, oh, that's a great strength. Like, I want to live up to who she was. And I just wonder, like, you haven't been writing as much, you said, because uh, your father passed. But I wonder, like, what has that meant and how has that evolved? If, you know, yeah, well, well, you know, actually, when you met me, it was like, it was about a month after my father had died. And, and and I, I had to go, I didn't have to go, but I was supposed to go on a book tour and I wanted to cancel it and my mother did the Polish thing, you know, and said that your father would have wanted you to go. <laughs> uh, so I flew here and, the, and the, the airline had lost my suitcase and they said, we actually, we didn't lose it, we just, we're gonna send it to you tomorrow so you don't need to buy anything like, you know, we're gonna send you st your suitcase. And they didn't send it for a week. Like every day they say, oh, it's gonna get here in two hours. So I, I w and, the, and the, after they got it to me, after a week, I was in a hotel, a very, very kind of nice, like a five-star hotel, you know, in New York. And I got a suitcase and I said, okay, wow, now I'm gonna shower and wear new clothes, you know, it's gonna feel great. So I put my suitcase on the floor and showered. And when I went out of the shower, I saw that my entire room was flooded and the suitcase was, kind of like, you know, half floating, you know, and everything got, got, had got wet. And, and you know, and before, and before I went to this trip, in a very, very uh, strange manner, like, you know, I, many times I do stuff and I don't know why. So uh, my father and me, we were very close and I spent a lot of time with him before he, he died and I, I feel very grateful for that. Uh, we had one thing in common, we were, we had the same number, in our sh we had, wear the same shoe number. Right, she says. So, so when I came to my mother and I said to her, like, I don't want to go on the tour, and she said that your father would have wanted to, on my way out, I just kind of bent down, I didn't even ask anybody, and I took a pair of his shoes. And when I packed my stuff, you know, some people take it, what I put his shoes inside, but it's like, it's not the kind of shoes that I wear, you know, it's not, but I just took it with me. And when they gave me uh, the suitcase back, so I, uh, I uh, opened it, you know, and the thing was that I wanted to take a pair of underwear, but because I just put the shoes on top of everything, so I took the shoes and put them on the television and took the underwear when I went to the, 
So when I came out, everything was wet but the shoes. <laughs> so I kind of, I wore my, and I had a big event in Symphony Space, so I kind of, I wore my father's shoes, you know? And I went to this event and I found myself, like instead of reading stories, kind of basically telling stories about my father and crying on stage and embarrassing myself, you know? And the, and so I don't know, I don't know why, why I don't know why I tell, tell that. That's <laughs> great. Um, well, we have some time. Uh, basically, what's going to happen, we're going to have questions from you guys. And then afterwards, everybody is going to buy every single book that Edgar sells. <laughs> Seriously, I will say this, that um, before, I, if I forget, there, I read as much as I possibly can. And there really is something so special and unique about his work. If you know his work, you already know this, so you don't need to worry about that. But like, if you've never read him, uh, there is one review I want to read from Amazon real quick, which I think is hilarious. There's a super praising one, but I'll just read the bad one. It says, um, the stories, if you can call them stories, make absolutely no sense. The author just strung sentences together, all 35 stories, and make no sense. <laughs> and and, uh, and I, that guy's a moron. Uh, but <laughs> I just want to say that. But, but, but actually, you know, when I talked about my free readers, that, that's the feeling that I had was that generally, I. For me, it, it makes perfect sense that if you try to say what you have in your mind, to other people, they won't get it. You know, I think uh, I, I'm saying, that, as I, I say, that, like, you know, failure seems so obvious right. natural, you know, but it, it's, the, it's the people who get it which surprise me. But there, I mean, there were 15 positive reviews and three. Mm -hmm. So you're, yeah. you were winning, in like five star pause. Anyway, <laughs> does anybody have a question? <laughs>